Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be taking a tour of the Cult Divinity Lost Scenario, The Atrocity Exhibition. Written by Jason Fryer, the adventure appears in 2018's Teroticum and Other Tales. You can also download a free PDF of the adventure from Helmgast and from DriveThruRPG, which is pretty cool that they made it available for free. Coming in at 28 pages, the adventure isn't physically long, but there is a whole lot to it. Our group took eight four-hour sessions to complete the adventure. However, the first two sessions of that really don't count because we were starting off a campaign with it, so we actually began the adventure two days before the scenario began, and that was pretty much the first two sessions, so it really took us six four-hour sessions, which is more accurate, but that's still a pretty good amount of time. One of the things that drew me to this adventure is that unlike the majority of the cult scenarios that are out there, the Atrocity Exhibition doesn't require a specific group of player characters in order to do it. Many of the other scenarios are made for a specific set of pre-generated characters for the story to work, and if a game master wants to use that adventure, they first have to untailor the adventure for those pre-gen characters and then retailor it for their characters that they have, if that's even possible with some of the scenarios. But however, the Atrocity Exhibition doesn't even have pre-generated characters, so game masters, you will need to have characters for this one. Uh, it doesn't matter what archetype they are, they can be any archetype you want as long as they are aware, but the best ones that you might want to think about would be artists, journalists, and socialites, and occultists. Those might fit in a lot easier, but they aren't the only ones you can use. Also, characters that have good combat skills are probably going to be good for this one because this one does have a lot of combat potential because there's a lot of fighting that can happen in it. The scenario was set in 2017, but that's easily adjustable to just being the present day. It's set in an art museum of a large city, though which city that is doesn't matter. For our campaign, uh, my players, I asked them where they wanted the campaign to be set, and they said Montreal, so we set the adventure in Montreal, so you can put this adventure in any major city that would have an art museum. The adventure centers around an art exhibit, consisting of eight paintings and a three-panel triptych. Now, while I've done several adventures that were centered around art and paintings, most of those scenarios didn't provide images for those paintings. You know, the ones that did, it was usually just a black and white illustration that we were given. Helmgast, however, has gone above and beyond here, because they provide full-color illustrations for all the paintings in the exhibit, uh, as well as their pretty damn good pictures as well, so that's an added plus. The cost, however, is that aside from the map of the museum where the exhibition occurs, there aren't any illustrations for NPC personalities or any of the scenes of the adventure. So for the purpose of this review, I'm going to be using the NPC portraits that I made for our game when we were doing it online, uh, just because I find it a lot easier whenever I'm discussing specific characters. If I can uh, show an image of that character that I'm talking about, it kind of keeps, you know, keeps it straight for everybody. And it's also a lot more interesting to look at pictures of somebody than it is to be you know, looking at my face. Uh, but the pictures, they are what I added to it. It's nothing from the scenario, and they might not be exactly the way they're described to look in the adventure. They're just the pictures that I used. There's also a good deal of 20th century history that this adventure covers. And Game Masters, I strongly encourage you to look up the information about the different events and the different places that are presented in the adventure. There's also several issues when it comes to the scenario's timeline that can make it difficult to follow because the scenario isn't always specifically clear on how much time passes between the different events events in uh, the backstory, so I do suggest that you really look at that because the players might ask specific questions about it. You want to make sure that your timeline that you know makes sense and can work, and I'll go into everything that I did in order for that to work in our game. So what I'm going to do is offer my tips, my criticisms, and my suggestions as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. Hey, and I'm Jack the NPC, full-time occultist and amateur rot critic, meaning yeah, I watched Bob Ross once. They say that art is transformative, and let me tell you, this adventure really does transform me. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. Send your game masters this way to see about running the atrocity exhibition for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, your suffering will be legendary. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. But first, the backstory. Guy Vaquellen was a notorious artist and libertine. He was also a death magician in the service of Togarini. Thirty years ago, he completed his masterpiece, the Atrocity Exhibition, and then took his own life, gouging his eyes out with his paintbrush. The pieces were then purchased by various collectors and scattered around the world. Fast forward to present day, Marielle Dubois, a wealthy socialite who in her youth was a lover and student of Aquellans, has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. 
Hoping to cheat death, she's acquired both legally and illegally all the pieces of the atrocity exhibition, hoping to use them to thin the veil between Elysium and Inferno in order to summon her master who will then grant her immortality. Now, because of the number of sacrifices that's required in order to do this, she's arranged for all the paintings to be unveiled together at a special midnight showing at the Cecil Thorne Art Center. Notable NPCs include Emmett Veers, the museum director, Mary Jensen, the curator, Anthony Dubois, Marielle's husband, who doesn't know of his wife's terminal illness or her past, but suspects that she might be having an affair. William Reeves, a private investigator that he has hired to see if she has been having an affair. Brahim Nasra, an international art dealer who's owned one of the pieces that was stolen for this exhibit. He's also brought along Samantha Church, a reporter to confront Marielle about the theft. And finally, Alano Tossett, the museum's chief of security, who recently died of a heart attack and was then subjected to living death by Vauquelin to aid Marielle in preparing this exhibit. Now, many of these NPCs you might not use or might not use them to the full extent that they're presented at the module. Now, for my game, I told my players that the first adventure of our campaign was going to be starting off inside of a museum, and one of the players said that she wants to work in that art museum, so we had it where she was working there, and her relationship that she had was to her boss. So for that, we went ahead and just chose Mary Jansen. So it was a really good way to work the group into this adventure because one of the PCs lived there and was able to witness all the strange goings on that happened in the days before the event. She was able to bring the rest of the group in in order to go to the unveiling for this, but other than that, you know, there were people probably she would invite it anyway because they were her friends, so it was a great way to bring the whole group in. How the player characters attend this event is really up to the game master to decide. You know, uh, you might do what I did, where you know, one or more of them work for the museum, or uh, maybe they're personal friends of some of the NPCs and get invited through those NPC friends, or they might be involved in the art community or be socialites that were just invited directly by Marielle. They might even just be catering staff or gate crashers who have to sneak past security in order to get inside. However you want to do it is fine. The player characters, they don't need to know each other in advance as long as you have a way to get them inside the event, they can meet each other once they're there. For my game, I made invitations that the characters receive, with a front and back telling them about the midnight showing. Now, according to the adventure, some of the invitations have skulls in one corner, which denotes which tickets are going to be in the first group allowed to view the exhibit. So I added a skull, but also made other variants as well, one with a painter's palette and the other with an hourglass, to denote that there were two other groups. So if any game masters out there wish to use the handouts that I made for my game, I went ahead and added a link in the video description below, so you can feel free to download those and use those to your heart content. Oh, hey, I got an invitation for some sort of fancy art showing. Yeah, this sounds boring as hell. They're probably just going to ask me for donations again, but hold on. For Quellen. What do I know that name from? The module says that characters who are familiar with death magic are going to recognize Vaquelin's name, and they can do some research into the exhibit and its sordid past. Uh, because one of my player characters was an occultist, I did have him recognize that name, so I made a couple handouts that I could give him when he does that research. Holy crap, this Vaquelin dude was one seriously messed up customer. Yeah, I should go check this event out, maybe learn a thing or two. If nothing else, I get to enjoy an open bar, maybe some of them tiny sandwiches. Guess I should pick up a suit. Because my players would want to research the exhibit in advance, I also made another handout going over the eight paintings in the triptych. I also made a biography for Vaquelin. There is a biography in the module, but it's also so spread out and is full of other information about his study of death magic at the time that makes it unusable to use as a handout because it gives away too many spoilers. So I cobbled this one together and added a few details like dates, which the module never gives. With these two handouts, Gate Masters could also have them be available at the exhibit itself. Itself. So when the player characters, if they don't research this, or if you just want to start the adventure off, you know, as they arrive at the night of the event, uh, you could have it where they pick these up at the door, you know, just, to, you know, little flyers to tell them a little bit about what they're going to see. The module gives us a map of the art center, but unfortunately there is some spoilery information that's on it, making it useless as something you can just give to your players. So I went ahead and I edited that out. Uh, so now we have a player's map. Also, the fact that the locations on each floor are numbered, you know, one, two, three, four, it caused a 
little bit of confusion with my players as they were trying to read the description for, let's say, room 7 that was on the basement level, but they ended up reading the description from room 7 on one of the other floors, so I added location labels to denote the main floor and the second floor as A and B. Once again, link to my handouts below if you want to get a copy of the maps that I made. The scenario opens on the night of the event. The player characters should be able to interact with some of the NPCs, maybe they get to meet one another, get a basic layout of the place as, you know, they travel between floors and look at some of the other exhibits that are open already. The Dubois Gallery, where the exhibit is located, is currently locked and guarded by security guards who also happen to be living dead. As the night progresses on uh, towards the unveiling, the Game Masters also might want to give some uh, strange events that might happen, you know, just strange goings on, you know, maybe uh, glimpses of people from the characters on past that are now intermingling with the crowd. Oh yeah, one of the player characters, she looked across the crowded lobby and for the briefest moment she saw a dead boyfriend moving amongst the crowd. And then another character, he went to the bathroom and while he was in there doing his business, he saw rotted fingers reaching up beneath the stall beside him. And man, it is amazing how often you use bathrooms in your different adventures. I ain't ever taken a leak in my life without something terrifying happening. It's my thing. Once the Game Master is ready, Marielle Dubois and her husband arrive. There's a bit more opportunity here for NPC interactions as they make their way around greeting everybody. And then after a short speech, Marielle announces that anyone that's got a skull on their ticket are going to be in the first group to go inside and view the exhibit. Oh, check it out. I got a skull in the corner of mine. Looks like tonight is my lucky night. Now, if any of the player characters maybe crashed this event, or maybe they came in with the wait staff, Game Masters should find a way to bring them in here. Uh, so if they stole a ticket, you could have it be where the ticket that they stole just happened to be one of the ones that's got a skull on it. Or as they're kind of intermingling with the event, you know, an NPC sees them and befriends them and kind of figures out a way to kind of sneak them inside for, you know, the, the first people to see this showing. And if in the event that one of the player characters does not go into the room to, as the exhibit is unveiled, you can can have an NPC that's also outside the room, you know, kind of uh, work as a good guide to lead them to where the player characters are going to go once everything starts going south. So you could uh, have an NPC that might be an employee or knows about the vault downstairs and they can lead the player character down there. That way the whole group can get together. So if they don't all go in there for the unveiling, no big deal. There is a pretty easy way to work around that. Inside the gallery, which none of the museum staff have been allowed to enter over the past few days as this exhibit's been set up, they're going to see that all the paintings have been arranged in a large circle with a large pentagram painted on the floor as if it's just part of the exhibit. Now, a couple things with all this. First, because I knew that the player characters, you know, might instantly try to destroy one of the paintings once everything starts getting weird on them, I had each of the paintings mounted on a three-foot high platform, and then that platform was encircled with this kind of a, a huge bronze and iron, you know, sheaths, kind of like a, a wreath, like crowns of thorns around them, so they get these kind of like three-inch metal spikes all along it, you know, kind of like concertina wire or something. Uh, so it kind of went with the motif of the exhibit, but it also meant that the player characters would have a little bit of difficulty getting directly up on those paintings. They'd have to you know, make a roll or overcome the fact that they are surrounded by basically a big ring of metal spikes. And that kind of could slow them down a little bit because, you know, I didn't want them to get too close to the paintings in case they decide to attack them. Next, I thought that having a pentagram on the floor just seemed a little bit odd because, you know, this exhibit consists of eight paintings and then the triptych. I made this one be a nine-pointed star uh, with one of the art pieces at each point. And then the gold sections, they faintly glowed as the player characters came in. Uh, and this symbol I'm also putting in my handouts in the link down below, so if game masters want to use that for their game, go right ahead. Wow, this place is great! How'd they get the floor to glow like this? And are they chaining the door shut? Yeah, that seems a little bit weird. Once the guests are all gathered together in the room, the security guards are going to quietly start chaining the doors shut. I give a chance for the player characters to maybe notice this little detail, maybe uh, start to mention something about it because it is a little bit odd, but as they're doing that, Marielle opens up the trip ditch and without any sort of warning at all just stabs and kills her husband, his blood splashing across the paintings, then all of a sudden the symbols on the floor start you know, being brighter and brighter and the paintings begin moving, and then the museum is plunged into inferno. Alano, the undead security chief, rips open and Vaquelin, or at least the Nephorite that Vaquelin has become, emerges from his body. He embraces Marielle and grants her her eternal life, which is done by transforming her into a living stone angel. And at the same time, purgatides emerge from the paintings and begin seizing and slaughtering the horrified audience. 
It is at this moment that the adventure really begins. Up until now, the player characters have been more or less following a timeline of events as different things have been happening to them. But now, as monsters start coming through the canvases and grabbing people and tearing them apart and yanking them back to God knows where, and people are surging towards those chained doors and they're unable to get out of here, the player characters' decisions are going to be life and death critical, which means it is pretty damn scary when the Game Master looks at you and asks, what do you do? Now, Game Masters, the player characters are probably going to be unarmed right now, and even if they did sneak a weapon or two past security, they're going to still be really outnumbered and outmatched here. So uh, different skills like observe the situation or act under pressure or avoid harm are probably going to be the better options and moves that they could try here. And you could have complications be instead of taking you know, physical damage if they fail any rolls, uh, you could have it be where they, you know, they bump into another guest, and that other guest kind of gets knocked in the way of a hooked blade or uh, maybe into one of the, the, the big wreaths of metal spikes that I had around them. So their action, their failure for doing an action, results in an innocent being you know, horribly eviscerated, which ends up damaging the player character's stability. Now Mary Jansen, who has the key card, knows the codes to unlock the employee doors, she's going to try to escape through one of those. And she might grab one of the player characters and you know, push them toward that door and tell them to head that direction. Meaning that this entire scene is more about escape rather than fighting. So I suggest that if the player characters uh, do escape, but they manage to you know, rescue any NPCs with them, that every NPC that they rescue might be able to help their stability recover a little bit more from this initial shock. So uh, kind of make it to get a little bit of reward for each person that they save. Once the PCs make it to the service corridor and it slams shut behind them against all the monsters rushing towards them, Mary can lead them down to her basement office where the vault is located, and that is the most secure part of the building. Now as they're heading down there, maybe taking a roundabout way as they're trying to avoid the purgatides and the living dead, everything should start changing around them. You know, fissures open up in walls to reveal ancient biomechanical machinery beneath it, or entire sections might start shifting to resist resemble places from Vaquelin's past, you know, so walls turn into white and blue stucco like in Tunisia, maybe they turn into old graffiti covered brick like you'd have in Milan or Paris. Doors turn into archways, the stairs turn into something like cut sandstone, as all the purgatories start kind of blending and mixing with the museum and everything starts shifting constantly throughout the rest of the adventure. Once the PCs make it to the basement, it's really up to them whatever they're going to do next. Meanwhile, Vaquelin is going to be spending the next two hours searching the place and trying to find any of the stragglers and people that are trying to get away, and then he's going to have all the guests you know, locked in one of the office, and then using the bodies of these guests, you know, he uh, kind of rips them open and turns them into paint pots. He turns them and he starts painting this huge ceremonial ring in the museum library, and that's going to take him 24 hours to complete this ceremony, which once again starts to hours after he starts, and that's going to open up the rift between Elysium and Inferno. So that gives the player characters 24 to 26 hours in order to stop him. Now a couple things here. First, the workroom beside Mary's office should have some rudimentary weapons, like you know, chisels and mallets. And I also said that they should have a first aid kit in there because it's got chisels and mallets and you know people hurt themselves. The loading dock should also have something like a crowbar for opening up crates. You know, Maybe have a fire axe that's located on each floor somewhere so the player characters can gather these up and use these as kind of improvised weapons. The security office also has monitors so somebody can watch all the rooms in the building. Uh, in a locked drawer is an automatic handgun, and the player characters can get that. I also added a couple other things here. Uh, so I added uh, two tasers that the player characters could pick up. I added a, a full trauma bag, so unlike the first aid kit that was in the workroom, we had a, you know, a full trauma bag here. Uh, there were three handheld radios uh, that were sitting on chargers, and a pair of bulletproof vests that were part of some anti-terrorism thing that the museum had. So this gives our heroes just a tiny bit of armor and a couple weapons, as well as a means to communicate with one another. So uh, maybe they could have an NPC that sits in the security room and is watching the feeds and is kind of radioing them updates as the player characters are making their way through the building. Oh yeah, we used the hell out of that security room. That private detective guy, William Reeves, he was our eyes and ears throughout the rest of the adventure. He would just be sitting there on his radio, letting us know whenever there was some sort of trouble up ahead, or whenever trouble was on the way. 
Now, as the PCs work their way through the museum, they're occasionally going to get pulled into one of Aquilin's purgatories. Now, these are memory locations from his past, being you know, warped and distorted dreamlike versions of those locations. There are five of these purgatory locations. Uh, 1950s Paris, 1960s Milan, uh, 1970s Gerba and City Bausset, and then final, uh, Vaquillen's final day as he completed the atrocity exhibition and took his own life. Game masters can do these purgatories in any order that they wish. The characters don't even have to go through all the purgatories or use them all. However, the final one does need to be the last one, the one where he completed the exhibit. Now, for my game, uh, I used all of the purgatories, and uh, my player characters re started using the skill Enhanced Awareness to uh, sense where these rifts were in the building because they were seeking them out. They wanted to go inside of them, but the module never mentions you know, how to go about it if the player characters are actually wanting to find these purgatories. I also brought up how the, the rifts, they seem to kind of uh, move throughout the building, kind of transforming things around them as they went. Uh, so that way the player characters, they might walk through one doorway one minute and it's totally fine, and the next minute they walk through it again, and all of a sudden they find themselves in Jerba. Now, I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty or a walkthrough of each of the purgatories. You know, once again, you can download the adventure for free. But I strongly encourage game masters to do a little bit of research on the real-world locations and histories there, kind of in order to enhance what it is that whenever you're running it. The first is 1950s Paris, when Vauquelin was young. It begins in the catacombs, and then emerges into the infamous Montmartre district, known for its artists, cabarets, music. And the district is essentially entirely uphill. Now, Game Masters should remember that this is not the real Paris. This is a nightmare version of Paris. You know, Vaquillen's memories, his perceptions of what Paris was like when he was young, but twisted and made strange as his mind has become twisted as well. So nothing here has even got to make sense if you don't want it to. The player characters, they might go up one of those tall stairways, and once they reach the top of it, they just see another one after that and another one after that. Or if they decide that they don't want to go up those stairs, they just want to go across town and see what's over there, they might start wandering around these twisting streets and suddenly emerge back where they started. Or maybe they'll emerge at the base of the same hill but coming at it from the other side. There's a bit of an Inception quality to all this, because dreams, they ain't got to make sense. Inception is a pretty good comparison to Purgatories and Cult. And like in that movie, while the dreamer, in this case Fuquellen, is populating it with twisted versions of you know, what he remembered, and desired, and regrets, so are the player characters that are visiting it. So they might encounter characters from their own lives or dark secrets. And those characters they encounter, they might attack them or try to convince them to stay here, or maybe share some important information that they never got to tell them during life. All the Purgatories have a few set encounters. Usually it's just the very beginning and the very end. But then Game Masters are given a list of just different suggestion ideas of what they could use. And they could use all of these or a couple of these or just simply make up their own. With Paris, the first encounter that I used is when they emerged from the catacombs, I had them encounter the eyeless violinist, which is a version of Aquellen's mother who begged them to save her child. And the reason that I chose this as the very first encounter they had in the purgatories is it's a good way of showing the players that while everything in here might be kind of twisted and weird, it's not necessarily hostile. Uh, some of the people that live here, you know, they might be indifferent, others might be helpful, and some of them certainly can be hostile. And I think if I made the first encounter be something Thing that you know might kind of look weird but actually wasn't threatening at all it would help the players kind of you know understand that this really isn't a place where they're gonna to have to fight everything here and not everything that tries to interact with them is going to try to kill them each of the purgatories leads to a version of aquellen from that time when he lived in whatever location that is again i allowed the player characters to use their abilities to detect the direction that they needed to go in order to uh, reach the exit out of here and each purgatory when they found aquellen he is at the age and kind of the uh, condition that he was when he really lived in these places. So at first, in the first two, he's a victim who's tormented by outside forces. You know, like in the first one, it's his barrister father, you know, telling him he's worthless and he's wasting his time with all this painting. The player characters might decide to attack Vakul in the moment they see him because he's ultimately the big bad guy for this event. Um, or they might try to help him out, you know, uh, shield him from his father, or maybe defeat his father for him. Now, either way, whether they attack him or not, that is going to free them from the purgatory and they can, you know, get back to the museum. But if they help him, essentially killing his demons, his tormentors, that's going to end up weakening the real Vaquelin back at the museum because that, that torment and everything is kind of what turned him into what he is. Also, while they're in the purgatories, they might gain certain talismans that can either protect them from the real Vaquelin or manage to hurt Vaquelin a lot more than any normal mortal weapons might. 
If they try to face off against the real Vaquellum too early on in the adventure without weakening him through these purgatories first, he's almost certainly going to kill them. He is incredibly powerful, and he's also got an army of purgatides and living dead to help him out. So it's not that just that he's a horrible monster, but they're going to have to get through a lot of bad guys before they can even get to him. So in our game, once they completed a purgatory and it kind of uh, faded away, or you know, the, a door opened and they were able to pass through it and go back to the museum or the real world, they were able to ch feel that change in his power. There was some sort of response that happened here. And then once they had an NPC that was in the security room and watching the monitors and radioing him up, telling him anything that they saw, the, that NPC was able to radio him and say that you know they had physically seen you know Vaquillen you know, uh, stagger in pain or uh, seem to shrink a little bit. And it's like it's like he shrunk rank, but he didn't shrink. And that was able to serve as a really big clue to the players that uh, defeating him required that they go into the purgatories and kind of front all these, and that was able to, uh, uh, to weaken him back here. That way they could manage to take him out once they're ready. Milan is the second purgatory, which occurs during the years of lead, when riots and bombing and protesters were all clashing with police. Now, two of the things here that I used that worked very well in our game uh, was first, the player characters were passing before the basilica, and they found this uh, square before it was filled with these thick poles, and the anarchists were tying prisoners to these execution poles. So uh, some of the people tied there were dead, some of them were living dead, and others were still alive. Now, among the prisoners that were still alive were several characters from the museum. Yeah, one of them was the museum director, and another was just kind of a random waiter. Now this led to an interesting moral dilemma for us, because we could easily just bypass this entire thing and sneak around it and not get seen and continue on with our mission. Or do we risk ourselves by sneaking into this forest of execution poles in order to free other museum guests that got trapped inside this purgatory? Next, one of the suggested encounters is that the player characters encounter a weapon stash of these anarchists in the back of a building, or you know, maybe they're cutting through the building and they stumble across all these weapons. And these weapons could be anything. They could be military, civilian, you know, some of them might be brand new, while uh, others might date back to the First World War. So what they found, it ranged between you know, Molotov cocktails and old German hand grenades, you know, richly engraved double barrel shotguns, or old World War I rifles that have bayonets or brand new submachine guns. And for our group, this was the first time that they got to get their hands on some firearms. They hadn't raided the security office yet, which made this a very useful cache to find. And it was also a really big turning point in the adventure for us because now the player characters had real weapons. Okay guys, the Game Master just gave us as many guns as we can carry. So take the hint and stock the hell up. Get enough for you and enough for the NPCs that we got stashed in the vault back home. Time for us to go on the offensive. The third purgatory is Jerba Tunisia, or Jeraba as the module calls it. The scene takes place in a desert, when this desert feels vast and eventually leads to a mountain dotted with caves. However, the real Jerba, while a desert, is also an island. Uh, theoretically, the island might have been the actual island of the Lotus Eaters from Homer's story, so that's kind of a cool little bit of trivia about that. Uh, but the adventure uh, description of this place makes it sound like it's talking about mainland Tunisia versus this island. Again, this is Vaquelin's dream of the place. So we ain't gotta be correct. So maybe mention that the player character is they can see in the distance a blood red sea and its surface is just littered with thousands of corpses you know, floating and tumbling in the waves. But no matter how much they seem to walk towards it, it never gets any closer to them. It's just right there in the distance. In Jerba, the optional event that I found the most interesting was the player characters encounter a necromancer who recognizes them for what they are, that they're not supposed to be here. But instead of attacking them, he betrays Vakuna Quillen by telling them you know, where they can find him. Uh, now, the idea is that this was a, a guy who was jealous of Aquilin's power. And what I wanted to do with it, I didn't actually get a chance to, but what I was trying to set this up for was later on, once the player characters enter the fifth purgatory, which that's when they're going down to Inferno, they might encounter the same necromancer again, you know, but now he's going to be far more powerful than he was then. You know, maybe he's even a full Nefer right now. Uh, but he's still jealous of Aquilin. They still have whatever rivalry it is. And uh, this, uh, a necromancer might be able to give a pact with one of the player characters, or uh, maybe a demand of the crown or the bone or uh, bone wand or any of the other artifacts that they might have found in exchange for something that the player characters want, uh, such as healing or a valuable piece of information that they could use on how to defeat him. It just didn't really work out that well in my game where I got to bring him back in, so I kind of like that as a little bit of foreshadowing whether I got to use it or not. Other than that, I found Jerba to be a nice change up from the kind of the claustrophobic feeling of being inside the museum or inside a city and now being kind of this 
open, vast, and empty desert. But I also found this to be the least interesting of all the purgatories. You know, the most notable aspect here, though, is when they find Vaquellen. He's no longer a tormented artist, but now a threatening necromancer that they have to defeat. The fourth purgatory is Vaquellen's villa, overlooking the Tunisian town of Sidi Bas Sayed. The villa is where the death magician artist hosted decadent orgies and where a very young Marielle de Bois studied underneath them, as well as other things underneath them. The house is a maze work of passageways and rooms, empty liquor bottles, mirrors of cocaine, there's all over the place around here. In the final room of this house, once they eventually make it there, they're going to discover dream versions of a younger Vaquellen and a very young Marielle having sex. However, their bodies have just recently been you know, sliced apart and dismembered, and the uh, pieces of their corpses are still writhing, trying to coupling and chop these uh, blood-soaked sheets. Now, several obsidian feathers should be lying around here as kind of a, kind of a quick little bit of foreshadowing before the real Marielle de Bois, who's now transformed into the grieving angel, you know, swoops down from above and lands on the bed, staring him down. Now, she is a powerful opponent, and fighting her is likely going to end pretty badly for the player characters. But if the player characters take that opportunity before she attacks, they might try talking to her instead. Okay, look, I get it. You tried to get back together with your ex-boyfriend, but things didn't work out exactly the way you wanted them to. So now your husband and countless other people are dead, and you've been transformed into some sort of horrible monstrosity, and your soul is going to be damned forever. We've all been there. But if you want to get revenge on your ex-boyfriend for what he'd done, you want to help us kick his ass? I really like that this encounter can be uh, solved through roleplay rather than combat, but I also really like that Mariel allows the player characters to learn what's going on, what the story is, why all this stuff is happening. A lot of adventures don't always give a means for the players, or at least for the characters, to learn what is going on and why. But if the players do talk to her, she gets to give them you know, what the motivations are and what all these different things mean. And that's a really good way for the players to learn kind of the, the full story, be able to appreciate that, uh, versus they kind of complete this adventure and they don't really know why all this stuff is going on. But then once they're done, the game master is like, okay, you know, and this is what's happening. It kind of gives them a rundown. This is a way that the players, if they do the right thing and they, you know, they talk to her and they're able to make the right roles and kind of give us some good role play with it, their characters can learn the full story of what's going on and I always love that in adventure. The final purgatory is different than the rest. The player characters find themselves in kind of a tunnel-like hallway of cracked plaster, curving round and round, like they're inside of a, a giant nautilus shell or snail shell. Windows and cracks along the walls, they reveal various other purgatories. You know, I had it where they could look through a window and it was like they were looking down on the streets of the Paris purgatory as if they were like on the top floor of one of the many buildings there. Or these windows might look on in kind of empty little workrooms or different things like that. Or they might be a full-blown view of the landscape of Inferno itself. Now, the end room of all this, once they've gone through you know, all the different halls, is the final moments of Aquellan's life. You know, as he just finishes painting the atrocity exhibition, and then he takes his own life by driving his paintbrush through his eyes one after another and into his brain and bleeds out on the floor, thus powering these paintings with his power. Now, the final scene isn't dangerous at all. It's really them just witnessing something going on. So the threats in this purgatory are all the things that happen along the way, which means it's whatever the game master decides to add along the way. One of those is the player characters coming across a crowd of corpse-like statues that are standing in a passageway, and then the lights go out on them. Now, I made these be the same living dead that they encountered in Jerba that were standing around Vaquellen as he was studying his tomes. I suggest that game masters might want to make these a lot like those nurses in the Silent Hill movie, the ones who stand frozen until something draws their attention, and then they all kind of quickly surge toward it, only to freeze in place again once that stimulus seats, you know, ceases. It's not the best movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a great little bit of inspiration and in understanding how purgatories work in the cult universe. The second encounter that I strongly recommend is the player characters come across this filthy old barrister, and they're going to recognize him as Vaquellen's father. Now, the player characters should recognize him because the father was the monster who was tormenting the young Vaquellen in the Paris Purgatory, but now he's this broken and filthy old man who's begging the player characters to put his son's soul to rest. Now, one thing that I added with this is that the father was now inside of an iron cage that had no doors. There was no way to get in or out. He was trapped inside this thing forever. He was a 
permanent prisoner inside Vaquillen's mind. And I found this to be a nice little bookend to the story. You know, it starts off with the uh, father being domineering and holding the son captive. And now, you know, the son is a man and his father is now a captive that he torments. And I kind of like the way that worked out. Once the player characters are ready, or at least feel that they're ready, even if they might not be fully ready yet, the only thing left to do is defeat Vaquillen himself. Now, he set himself up in the museum lobby, and he's painting this elaborate circle using the, the corpses of all the different guests as paint pots. Now, several more guests are currently locked in the offices under guard, so the player characters might try to rescue them, but they have nowhere to go. Now, Vaquillen is incredibly tough. He's got 11 harm and a lot of magic. And that's before we even get to the small army of purgatides and living dead that are protecting him as well as the paintings themselves. Now, the module says that the actions within the purgatories should weaken him, but it never really says what that means. Uh, so I suggest, because there's five purgatories, that each one completed would mean one harm to Vaquillen. That closes the gap pretty well, leaving him still pretty formidable but manageable to defeat. Now, of course, if they turn the grieving angel to their side, she's going to join into this final combat, you know, taking all the purgatides and living dead at once, you know, or obsidian wings kind of slashing through their ranks, and allowing a brief window where the player characters get to make their move directly against Vaquillen or against the paintings without any of these other bad guys trying to stop them. Hey, ugly! Yod is uninspired and lacking in original form. Also, your girlfriend thinks you're an asshole. Yeah! Once Vaquillen is defeated, the museum returns to Elysium. You know, the corpses and the damage done all vanish, leaving no sign of the recent violence here. Now, one thing that the adventure doesn't explain is what happens back at Elysium while all this stuff is going on. You know, what, what do these people think about this museum? Is it still here? Are they, you know, not able to get inside of it? And the player characters, you know, they might have been gone for a full day because once again, it's a 24-hour ceremony after two hours of hunting everybody. So yeah, it could be up to 26 hours later. So for my game, I had it where the museum was still in Elysium. People could still see it, but nobody could get inside of this place. So police and emergency vehicles had circled around it and they were stationed around. And the Lichters, you know, they manipulated it to where everyone thought there was some sort of, you know, terrorist hostage situation going on inside. So when the museum was thrust back into Elysium and everything is uh, reforming and bodies and bullet holes are kind of blowing away like dust, leaving everything just in mint condition, I had the player characters roll to see if, you know, all the uh, stimulus from this experience, you know, all the colors and all the, the energies and everything as the illusion was snapping back into place, uh, to see if they were able to remain conscious during all this. And those that did, they were able to, you know, see SWAT teams suddenly, you know, breach the front doors and come repelling down from the skylights above, and they're you know, wearing gas masks, and they're running around with all their guns as the player characters are kind of uh, weakened and disoriented now that they've returned to Elysium. And then the player characters awoke in the hospital, and they were getting all these interrogations about all the stuff that happened, and the interrogations were focused on some sort of botched art heist, like art thieves had flooded the museum with some sort of hallucinogenic nerve agent, and the player characters and these stories that they tell about, you know, monsters and going down to Inferno and going to 1950s Paris, you know, that's all assumed to be part of, you know, whatever uh, chemical it was that these, you know, robbers released in the air, and many of the people that are missing are assumed to be part of these robberies. So, you know, they now think, you know, the uh, head of security, who's obviously gone. He was obviously part of this whole thing, and anyone else might have been involved as well. But then after a few days, all the stories of this, you know, huge botched robbery, they kind of fade from the headlines as the Lichters kind of quickly sweep that over, and nobody really remembers it for that long. Overall, we had a lot of fun with this adventure. We got a lot of hours of playtime in this. And one feature that made it very effective when we're doing our, you know, three to four hour sessions is uh, how we would do it as the player characters. They'd spend the first half of the session, you know, going around the museum gathering supplies or information, uh, role-playing with any of the other survivors, you know, rescuing other guests, and then we would then go to a purgatory, and we'd go through that purgatory, explore that, and we would end the session as they completed the purgatory, and they were uh, re-emerging back in the museum that we were setting it up for the start of the next adventure, and that was a really nice way of doing it, where each adventure they got to go to a, a different place, but they also got to have a little bit of time back at the museum to kind of, uh, kind of advance the story there, interact with the people there, and then go off on a separate adventure somewhere, and it worked very, very 
well. I enjoyed the little kind of journey through history and along several different countries. You know, I do wish the timeline of Aquilin's uh, life was a little bit better written out to uh, make it a bit easier to follow and more of a shareable way. That way you can give a lot of this information directly to the players uh, without giving them any spoilers at the same time. Uh, so once again, I've got my timeline that I made up of Aquilin's life as a handout that I made, so feel free to download that and use it yourself. Because the museum is such an important setting for all of this, it's really the only real setting that we have, I personally would have liked it had the museum been a little bit bigger, you know, give us a little bit more room to kind of move around and hide and, you know, try to rescue people. So uh, maybe if I had like one extra wing or two extra wings, I might like that a little bit more. Uh, maybe give a little bit of distance between different objectives that the players are trying to do, you know, instead of just kind of all being inside one single building that actually is pretty open from the basement to the second floor. The, the center part's mostly open due to the stairwell, so I kind of would like a little bit more elaborate of a museum. Now, because it doesn't have to be set in any particular city, and game masters can use any city in the world that they want, wherever it is that you set your adventure, you might want to look into art museums in that area and maybe try to use one of those. If you can find a floor plan online, you know, just kind of uh, change it up a little bit, that way you've got all the different things that you need for the adventure, or just you find one online and make that up yourself. So while the map is usable, and it's actually a pretty nice looking map, I think you would do better off if you had a little bit more of an elaborate one. Next, well, Cult isn't a game where, you know, player characters, you have to choose a certain number of language slots or anything like that. You know, characters in this game can play, you know, can speak whatever languages it is that the player decides is appropriate for them. But one area that game masters should be aware of before you run this is that there are a lot of languages in this adventure, French being the main one. Now, that wasn't an issue for us when we ran it because, you know, I'd ask my players where they wanted their adventure to be set, and they happened to choose a place that speaks French, so that was pretty easy for us to do. But it it be a stretch for any other game masters out there, depending on their campaign, that that might be a problem if they don't have characters that speak enough languages or any of these languages. So just something to consider beforehand. You might have NPCs that can accompany them, that can act as translators or you know, make any changes, but just be ready before it before you run the adventure. That way you don't uh, kind of suddenly hit a bump or nobody can understand what these NPCs are saying to them. The adventure is also a bit more combat focused than a lot of other cult scenarios. And because the player characters might not be armed because they're coming to a fancy event once you know when the action starts they might find themselves completely out of weapons you know be ready to offer various improvised weapons around the place such as a walking stick that one guest dropped you know I already mentioned you know, fire axes and workshop tools and flaming liquor bottles from the bar or allow for creative ways of escaping various threats such as uh, in our game one of the purgatides that was stalking them around on the lowest level that had no eyes so I described it was sniffing the air and kind of sniffing them out so one of the player characters ran up to the bar that had been knocked over and all the scuffle and he found a bottle of pungent alcohol and started spreading that around the place you know like Jägermeister or something in order to mask his scent. Once again you can find the adventure in Tarotikum and other tales or as a standalone PDF on both the Cult Divinity Lost website and on DriveThru RPG for the low low price of totally free. We got a lot of hours of enjoyment out of this adventure so I suggest that you give the Atrocity Exhibition a look. On a personal note, pre-orders for the Seskorkowski RPG Icon dice are still open. Release date is April 6th. Now, after that date, the dice should be available through other retailers as well, uh, such as you know, Amazon, or maybe order them from your local game shop. Uh, hopefully that would reduce the uh, high shipping that's from Poland. A lot of people had mentioned the high shipping when I had done the initial announcement, but you know, the shipping from Poland and international shipping can get expensive. So uh, if you wait till after April 6th, hopefully you can save yourself some there. Also, I've gotten confirmation from Key Workshop that individual dice will be available through their website. So anyone that's wanting an additional 12-sided uh, D6 or an additional D20 or whatever else, uh, they're going to be able to order those soon. They just aren't there yet because Key Workshop has to make the dice. The initial run, all of them were assigned to different boxes. So they didn't have any loose ones around to be able to sell them individually. So once those are available, they should be available through the website, hopefully not much longer. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, just once among my many lives and incarnations, would I like to go to an auction or a museum exhibit and not have to crawl across a floor of blood and entrails before gunning down some horrible monster? I don't think it's too much to ask.